All right, great. Well, uh, thank you all. Thank you guys for being here. Um, uh, my name is Elijah, and today I'm going to talk about uh, pollination ecology and how it can be integrated into your gardens in the Owens Valley. Um, so just the agenda for my presentation, I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit more. Then I'm going to focus on floral ecology and then transition into more of a pollinator focused perspective. Um, talk about how that can be integrated into your garden and then highlight some of the important uh, flowers that are um, native to Owens Valley. Okay, so I'm a pollination ecologist, which means that I study the interactions between plants and pollinators over time and space. And I'm particularly interested in the impacts of climate change on pollination. Um, and I've studied pollination ecology in um, a bunch of cool environments. So this is a picture of a field site from uh, the San Jacinto mountain range in um, Southern California, where I just finished completing the spring field season there. <clears throat> I've also worked in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, uh, the plains in North Dakota, and then um, as you may recognize here, um, the White Mountains of California. Um, and uh, so I am, uh, I don't personally myself own a garden or uh, although I am an enthusiast, but uh, what I can talk about a little bit more is um, the perspective uh, as an ecologist. So there we go. Um, <clears throat> uh, so what is floral ecology? Um, it's just the study of when and where flowers are blooming. Um, so when in the season are these flowers blooming um, in, a, in one species or in many species in a community of flowers? And how does that uh, timing and spacing of flowering impact uh, plant pollinator interactions? So because I uh, focus a lot on climate change, um, the, uh, and climate change has a, a long history of impacting these types of distributions. Um, I just have some examples. So you can see in these uh, little videos that I have, the, that phenology between plants and pollinators is shifting and it isn't necessarily shifting in the same direction at the same time, which can cause what's known as a phenological mismatch. And also um, species are shifting in elevation and also latitudinally. Um, and these changes in where species are distributed in time and space can impact um, entire ecosystems because of plants and pollinators important role in our natural habitats. Um, so just to uh, talk a little bit more about floral phenology. Um, so phenology is the seasonal timing of biological events. And for flowering, um, you can think of this as a, if you think of like a meadow, um, the, the phenology of flowers in one species of a population will look something like this graph here where there will be a peak flowering time where most flowers are, are in bloom and uh, with less flowers before that time and then flowers dying out later in the season. And so this is what one population of flowers would look like say in a meadow. And when you combine it with um, all the other species of flowers, you have a flowering community that can be very diverse and stable um, in order to uh, pollinate efficiently and, and um, have successful pollination for plants and also for pollinators. So when there is phenological overlap like this, when multiple species are flowering throughout the season and there's always a number of flowers blooming, um, <clears throat> this is beneficial to pollinators because it presents a constant resource, a food source for pollinators and also a constant um, pollinating mechanism for plants who require animals to, to assist them in the transfer of pollen. And um, this is a video from my research in the White Mountains. So um, uh, just to set the stage a little bit, each of these squares is a two by two meter plot that is um, literally in the White Mountains. And what I did last summer was count the flowering phenology for every species of flower in these plots. And um, each species has its own color. And the larger the point, the more flowers. And um, I'm just gonna play this and um, I want to highlight the differences between different plots and how different the flowering communities are. Oops. 
So I'll just play that one more time. And um, you can see that not only are the species different, which you can notice from the differences in colors, but the density of flowering is different and the duration of flowering is not the same either. And these characteristics are really important in natural environments um, because these are what drive pollination or pollination to occur um, for plants and pollinators. This floral um, composition is, is, is critical for pollinator interactions. And this is important because um, diversity begets diversity. So a diverse uh, number of species of flowers is going to have a diverse species pool of pollinators, uh, species that are, or floral communities that are temporally diverse or phenologically diverse will also have more diverse pollinators and uh, diverse floral functional traits, which I'll um, explain in just a second, also promote uh, pollinator diversity. And pollinator diversity is incredibly important, not only for the plants, but also for, um, for their community stability. So floral functional traits is this um, new idea within um, ecological research. The, or the idea of uh, functional traits is not necessarily new, um, but what a, functional traits, what a functional trait is, is basically a, a morphological feature that allows one animal to interact with another. So in, for pollination, these functional traits for flowers are things like the the shape of the flower, the color, the size of the flower, um, its odor, and its nectar quality are all important characteristics that can determine which plants are pollinated by which pollinators. So when we take a look at this community uh, phenology graph again, if instead we are using functional traits, um, you can see that there are only, despite there being two or four species, there are only two different functional traits, which means that there are potentially only two options for pollinators. And what this means is that um, as an ecologist, we can predict which plants will be pollinated by which species of, of pollinator. Um, and it helps us, uh, yeah, predict our, our research and um, future trends in pollinator communities and plant communities. <clears throat> and this is important because native plants have co-evolved with native pollinators. So the first bee species evolved over 100 million years ago. And since then, um, plants and pollinators have evolved specific structures that allow themselves to only be pollinated by a select group of animals. Um, so for example, uh, plants and pollinators need to be phenologically synchronous, they need to be functionally synchronous, and they need to be spatially synchronous. Um, so if a pollinator is not synchronous in these ways with a flower, then they're not going to be able to pollinate it. And um, this can lead to um, a lack of pollination even when it could potentially occur. And this is especially important in arid species where the environments are, are more limited by, by climatic factors such as precipitation and the need for coevolution is even stronger in areas like Owens Valley where <clears throat> um, a lack of precipitation uh, makes the, the opportunity to flower and to forage very narrow compared to other environments. And I have a, a video here um, just uh, showing, highlighting another type of floral functional trait and how this is, how it is specific to um, particular pollinators. So hopefully you will be. This buzzing is a secret password, the key to a lock. What this bumblebee is after is pollen. Bumblebees eat pollen. It's high in protein. But the flower doesn't want to give it to just anyone. So it hides it away in those bright yellow anthers. For a flower, that's unusual. Most flowers keep their pollen on the outside of the anther, which is the male part of the flower. Pollen is basically sperm for plants. Most flowers make sugary nectar, too. They use it as bait to attract bees and other pollinators, which get coated in pollen along the way. 
And since bees are messy, they inadvertently scatter some of that pollen onto the female part of the next flower they visit. That's how most flowers have sex. But this type of flower doesn't offer nectar. The only way to get to its pollen is through those tiny pores at the ends. But the bumblebee knows just what to do. It wraps its legs around the flower and bites down on the anthers, that male part of the flower. See those wings shaking? Normally, the bumblebee uses those powerful muscles to flap its wings. That's what makes the buzzing sound when they fly. But here, those muscles vibrate its whole body, so hard and fast that it makes a louder, higher-pitched buzz. This vibration shakes up the pollen trapped inside the anthers until it spews out all over the bumblebee. It's called buzz pollination, and you don't need a bumblebee to do it. A tuning fork will do. The bumblebee grooms the, oh, sorry. the pollen down into sticky sacks on its legs, carries it back to the hive. Only a few types of pollinators, like bumblebees, are capable of buzz pollination. Honeybees can't do it. This field is kind of a free-for-all. Think Las Vegas buffet. Tons of food, but long lines. Lots of competition. Buzz pollination is more like a private club. By only permitting pollinators that know the secret knock, the flower ups the chances that its pollen will end up on flowers from the same club, the same species. The bumblebee? Well, sure, it has to work a little harder, and there's no sweet nectar. But it's a reliable pollen stash that almost no one else has access to. Tomatoes, potatoes, blueberries. All of these need buzz pollination to reproduce. Much of the food we eat owes its existence to that buzz. Okay, so <clears throat> that's just one example of the way that of the ways that flowers have evolved to only permit certain species of pollinators to um, interact with them. And this is uh, this occurs all over the world between native species in one place uh, or native species of uh, flowers and plants. And it uh, leads to a very efficient um, <clears throat> mode of pollination between plants and pollinators that are native to their area. Our seek oh, sorry. Um, and non-native plants um, can be, you know, you can uh, plant non-native plants in their, in outside of their native habitat and they can succeed, but that does not mean that their native pollinators are going to uh, follow them. So <clears throat> uh, non-native plants need to be pollinated by non-native or by native uh, pollinators, even though they are not from there. And this is potentially, um, harmful to pollinators because the nutritional value of non-native flowers is oftentimes inadequate or different than the resources that native pollinators require. <clears throat> and this also uh, presents an issue due to the lack of pollen transfer and a plant perspective because non-native pollen can re reduce the reproductive success of native plant species because instead of transferring native pollen from one plant to another, bees are transferring non-native pollen to native plants, which does not result in um, seed set. <clears throat> so now I wanna focus a little bit more on the pollinator perspective. Um, so when you think of pollinator, you probably think of bees, that's what I usually think of. And there are many other species of pollinators, but bees, are, the, are by far the most efficient pollinators and they're the ones that I focus on. So uh, my examples will, will be about bees. And when you think bee, the bee that most people um, think of are, are honey bees, right? Um, they're, they're the most famous and widespread species of bee and probably pollinator in the whole world. 
But the thing about honeybees is that they are not native to the United States. They're European honeybees is their, is their common name, Apis mellifera. Um, and they were introduced here when Europeans came to North America. And since they have spread both commercially due to our farming practices, but also non-native um, wild populations of honeybees have spread all over North America and all over the world. And this is especially concerning in the Southwest where we live because um, they, the wild uh, honeybee populations are mixing with Africanized honeybees that are coming from the South um, and resulting in feral Africanized populations all throughout the deserts of the Southwest. And honeybees are um, really good at their jobs as pollinators. That's why um, us humans like them so much, but they also come with a number of caveats. Um, so what makes them good at being pollinators, such as their socialization, most bees and most pollinators are not social. Um, they're able to pollinate all year long. They're super generalist. They can pollinate almost any kind of flower besides buzz pollinated ones like we just um, learned about. And they target specific species, so they go out and um, each day pick different species to target, and they can fly very far distances, up to miles. And while these are all beneficial, if you're thinking about the amount of honey you're bringing in, this is actually causing a lot of uh, competition between these non-native pollinators and, and native pollinators for resources. So because they are so good at pollinating, they're actually out competing native bees and other pollinators. And um, this is a more accurate representation of what your average native pollinator looks like. So there are 4,000 species of bees alone in North America and 20,000 species of bees in the whole world. Um, and the vast majority of them, over 75% of them are solitary, which means they don't have a colony or a hive. Um, the females make one nest by themselves, they lay their eggs and they uh, forage for them and then die in that same year. So they're only adults for in a period of two to six weeks. And these native pollinators, like I've uh, mentioned, are co-evolved with their floral communities, which means that they likely only visit a specific number of native flowers. And because these pollinator and these um, your native bees are typically much smaller than uh, say your average bumblebee or even honeybees. Uh, there are several thousand species of bees that are less than half a centimeter in size. This is, a, this is um, even a, a larger species here on the screen. And because of that, they can only fly short distances. So that means that their behavior is much different than that of honeybees. Um, and it also means that they can easily be outcompeted by honeybees. Um, and I just want to highlight the diversity of bees here. Um, <clears throat> there are, like I said, there are 20,000 species. They come in all colors and shapes and sizes. Um, this is an example of some of the, a couple of the largest and smallest. So the large bee here is the valley carpenter bee, which is native to California. And it's standing next to a small uh, helicted bee, I believe. And then here in the corner, that is one of the smallest species of bee in the world, the smallest species in North America, and that's Perdita minima. And this is actually a native of um, the Owens Valley as well. It's native to the deserts of the Southwest. <clears throat> So the, the, the competition between honeybees and native bees has implications for pollination. Um, so because the spatial and phenological synchrony is especially important for native pollinators, it puts them at risk not only of climate change and stuff like that, but because they're only out there for a short amount of time, um, the resources that, that they have are uh, more important to them than the average honeybee. Uh, population. So <clears throat> honeybees are really able to outcompete them and that's been shown um, through research and, and it can be harmful to native bee po populations. And uh, while honeybees, like I mentioned, are super generalist, they, uh, most, most native bees do not visit more than um, say a dozen species of flowers. And a lot of species of native bees are specialists on either one genus of plant or even one species of plant. Um, 
<clears throat> and uh, that means that they typically are not able to pollinate non-native flowers while honeybees can pollinate both non-native and native flowers. So um, this and can in, uh, in combination with other uh, issues uh, that humans are causing to our natural environments such as climate change and uh, uh, decreased precipitation and higher temperatures, increased land use and pesticide exposure um, creates an uncertain future for these native pollinators because of this and also because of the uncertainty of their native um, flowering resources. And this is um, bigger than just uh, a couple of species of bees potentially going extinct or something like that because of the role that pollinators play within our ecosystems. Um, pollinators are essential, are an essential ecosystem service, which means that they are responsible for um, the ecosystem uh, functioning because they help plants reproduce, which allows our entire ecosystems to function successfully. And uh, uh, for us in particular, 60 to 80 percent of all plants require pollination, and um, uh, one third of every a cup of food that we eat is animal pollinated. So it, it impacts not only natural environments, but also agricultural systems as well. Um, so is there a way that we can easily help this, a silver lining? Well, that might be native gardens. Gardens can, um, in theory, be mostly beneficial, but also potentially harmful to pollinators. Um, if you are introducing non-native species in your gardens, and they have they can have potentially harmful impacts on on your native pollinators due to certain um, chemicals in their pollen that are are evolved specifically for their native pollinators but not for the pollinators in their in their introduced area um, but mostly this presents a potential to have a valuable floral resource added to um, the landscape so um, this is because there are limitations in natural environments that are not present in gardens. So uh, the main environmental limitation in Owens Valley would be precipitation or water access. So this is, I just pulled this from a weather website uh, just to show that um, as you must, as you probably know, Owens Valley and Bishop do not receive a lot of annual water and um, what that means is that the plants are both adapted to the, uh, to low amounts of water, but are also highly responsive to variation in, in the water that they receive. And um, typically when plants are water stressed, they have to decide between um, low, imp low risk, low reward vegetative growth, so just getting bigger, or high risk, high reward reproductive growth or um, making flowers. So because gardens are not typically limited by water like natural environments, the plants in your gardens are able to um, A, have uh, grow more flowers than native species or than uh, wild uh, species might be able to or wild uh, populations of the same species rather. And they also can um, produce more nutritious food for uh, pollinators. So um, increased water resource can improve the quality of pollen. It can also improve the sugar content and nectar. So what this means is that a native garden can basically be a, a little pool of extra nutritious resources for pollinators. <clears throat> and this is especially true, I think, in Owens Valley where most residences are pretty close to natural environments. Um, in, in the valley, even if you live in a town, you're likely only uh, maybe half a mile from, uh, you know, the whole wide open landscape of Owens Valley, um, <clears throat> where there are uh, native uh, flora and fauna. So <clears throat> what this means is that native pollinators can most likely easily access your gardens, even if they are small and they can't travel very far. And they can receive this nutritious food, which is beneficial to the pollinators. And this is also beneficial to the plants, because if you plant native, pl uh, native plants that are the same species as the wild plants in your surrounding area, you're going to improve the outcrossing of pollination and of, of pollen, and you're going to uh, result in uh, basically a, a more successful natural environment just by um, having these native uh, pollen resources that, that um, 
improve reproductive success in plant communities. So this can be um, a sustainable resource that benefits both plant and pollinators. And also this is, I think, one of the um, most effective, easy and direct forms of conservation that you can do kind of at a local scale. Um, by, by having a native garden, you can, um, like I've mentioned, um, benefit both native pollinators and native plants and um, help uh, create a sustainable natural environment surrounding your homes in, in Owens Valley. Um, so with that, I just wanna uh, highlight a couple of the major native flora that are uh, potential um, assets for your garden. <clears throat> so first is the uh, showy milkweed, which blooms in the summer. Um, and these are typically going to require a uh, full sun and um, usually uh, not a tremendous amount of water since they are native species. And um, milkweed is especially important for pollinators. They're very popular for a wide variety of bees, especially uh, bumblebees. And as you probably know, they're very important for uh, a species of butterflies as well. And they also host um, hoverfly and surfed fly larvae, which uh, attack and uh, prey on aphids and mealybugs, which might be beneficial for your garden in general. Second, we have a uh, panamint plume, which is a a summer flowering plant. Um, these are pollinated by a variety of, uh, of pollinators and you can usually find a lot of different kinds of bees on them. Um, and this is a good uh, generalist plant, I would say, in terms of pollination. Uh, next is the apricot mallow. This is an early bloomer with the potential to rebloom in the fall. Um, and this is a really interesting um, species of, of plant because they have specialist they have specialist bees that only visit these these flowers. So if you see these um, plants in nature, you can most likely find uh, small swarms of bees flying around these. And that's because those bees are males that are trying to find females since they know that these are the only flowers they can visit. Um, so males are waiting on these flowers to opportunistically mate. So that's a, an interesting thing to see if you happen to have or to find these flowers. Um, another one is the Inyo bush lupin. Um, so this is a spring, a, a blooms in the spring, and these are especially important for um, bumblebee species because the way the flowers are designed, um, they need to be like sat on basically to open up the flowers. Um, so this is a, another good native species for your garden potentially. Um, also the uh, prickly pear species. Um, <clears throat> these are another species that have a wide variety of bee pollinators and uh, in addition to um, specialist bee pollinators. Um, so this is another one similar to the, the globe mallow. And then uh, lastly, we have the princess plume, which is in the same genus as the panamint plume. Um, and this one is an early bloomer, and uh, it also um, likely has a diverse community of pollinators. I'm sure you can see a lot of um, honeybees on this uh, when it's in bloom. This is what it looks like um, in June. Okay, um, so in summary, uh, there are many excellent um, native plant species to begin your garden with um, or to add to your garden. Um, and then uh, ecologically, plants and pollinators need to meet several requirements to interact. Um, humans are threatening pollination, but native, po native gardens can help both native plants and pollinator communities. And um, uh, from the, an ecologist perspective and a pollination ecologist, um, here are just a couple of tips that I would have uh, for, um, for your garden. So uh, when choosing your plants, um, you should, just try to get as a, a greatest diversity as you can or, or as you want. Um, it will benefit the most pollinators and have the most benefit to um, yeah, native, native plants and pollinators. Uh, make sure that they're phenologically variable. So for example, the panamint plume and the other plume that I, that I highlighted um, would be an excellent species or would be excellent species to plant in the same area because one is an early blooming plant and one is a late blooming plant. So it could provide a longer period of 
of flowering. And as you can probably tell from those pictures I showed, they have very similar flower types or flower functional traits. So they could probably be pollinated or they are likely pollinated by the same native pollinators. Um, and that leads me to um, the, the tip to try to get functionally diverse flowers. Um, so that means uh, uh, most obviously like different shapes of flowers. So if you have like an aster, like sunflowers or something like that, those are, are one type of flower and uh, lupins, for example, penstemons have a specific type of bee that, uh, and pollinators that typically pollinate them um, and other, other types of flowers. And also um, the plants that I highlighted were all like large plants, but there are thousands of species of bees that are, that are tiny and require small flowers and small plants. So it's a really good idea to not only plant these large, um, perennial plants, but also to sprinkle in um, small annual plants uh, within them if you want to try to maximize your uh, pollinator diversity in, in your garden. Um, also, um, <clears throat> just from just a general tip, the bee hotels that are that have become very popular are are have been um, found. There are um, recent publications that show that they aren't actually that beneficial and they actually promote the spread of disease. So if you're thinking about getting one, um, maybe just uh, look into it a little bit more because they're not um, always going to be beneficial. And also if you're trying to maximize the diversity of pollinators, um, these are only useful for, um, it's one, it's like one genus of bee typically visits or, or use these nests. So um, it's not going to maximize the, the number of bees that are the number of pollinators that you have in your garden really. Um, another general tip is just to reduce the frequency of lawn care. Um, there are studies that, can't, can't, that have come out that have found that if you just uh, mow your lawn like two weeks more infrequently, then you can significantly improve the number of pollinators that are, that are found around your home. And that's because you're allowing the, um, the flowers that are within your grass, like clovers or dandelions to, to come up. And even if those aren't native species, um, uh, some flowers are better than a green um, kind of like flowerless plain, which is not not ecologically beneficial at all. Um, and then lastly, if you, uh, yeah, um, just you should not use pesticides on anything that a pollinator might land on. So any flowering plants you should avoid using those. They can be sequestered into the pollen. So even if you're not uh, spraying them on flowers, the pollen can have these toxins in them and can impact um, uh, honeybees and, and also your native pollinators. Okay, so that is everything that I have. So now I guess I will take questions. Thanks, Elijah. Um, really quick before we do questions, I just want to share a resource that I can send um, out to all of you. Um, I'm going to, um, I'll stop sharing. If we need to come back, I'll open it. Okay, I'm actually going to share something real quick. Okay. Um, so I will send this out to you, all of you, um, but this is actually on our website, on our pollinator garden page. Um, and this is, we do have a recommended plant list with um, several of the great plants that Elijah mentioned, um, and then some additional ones that will show you hopefully when they bloom, um, how big they get, what type of environment they like. Um, and so I just want to let you know that that resource exists and I will send that out to all of you um, after this workshop. Um, and if anyone has questions for Elijah, feel free to either um, raise your hand or type them in the chat box um, or unmute yourself, either way. So. Um, Wendy. Um, so I don't live in the Eastern Sierra. I live in Corona Del Mar by the beach in Orange County, not mm -hmm. too far from Riverside actually. And um, we are re-landscaping, doing like water friendly. We're trying to do things that are good for the environment. But mm -hmm. I will great, probably great. need a whole different group of flowers. Uh, we see some pretty interesting ones when we walk along Crystal Cove State Park. And uh, I don't know whether we're only, what are we, half a mile from the ocean, Fred? 
maybe a half a mile from the ocean and we live on a hill, so we get the ocean breezes and the ocean everything. Is there a, a, a site where I could find native plants that would be good for my specific area? Um, I know Calflora is a resource that I use a lot. Um, that has a list of all of the native plants that are in the state and it has information about where they are and um, where and, and other information like when they bloom as well. Is that uh, a just, web is that a website or yeah, I think it's cal it's C A L F L O R A and it's either dot org or dot com. If you oh, Google okay. those words it'll it'll come okay. right up. Great, thank you. Um, and I can include that in the email too. Um, another resource I want to add is reach out to, you most likely have a, um, a local California Native Plant Society oh. in that area. I'm not sure which chapter it is. Elijah, I don't know if you know that off the top of your head, but um, I would definitely suggest reaching out to them. They Great. can thank probably you. direct you in the right. Mm -hmm. And um, just so, uh, one more thing about Calflora as well is they have a list of native plant nurseries on there. And I think mm -hmm. that might be connected either to the California Botanical Society or, or CNPS, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, there's a list of, of uh, native nurseries, which is really great um, for the entire state. Um, and I, I use it for research purposes as well to get native plants for greenhouse studies and stuff. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Elijah, we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, Val asked, carpenter bees are native? Um, and then mm -hmm. asked, are carpenters dangerous for invading the woods of our homes? Mm. So, uh, yes, there are, uh, carpenter bees are native. The, I think the only non, well, the only non-native species of, of bee that I know of are honeybees. Um, typically, they don't uh, they are uh, like uh, humans have not really gone about introducing bees into areas that they don't belong besides honeybees um, and maybe like the blue orchard bee which is a, a type of leafcutter bee common for um, like alfalfa and, and blueberries and stuff but um, yes carpenter bees are native and I know there are at least three species of native carpenter bees here um, I actually study one of them um, Xylocopa californica um, which is the uh, yeah it's the um, what's his name? I'm not sure what his common name is, but um, there's that one, and then there's uh, California uh, uh, Xylocopa ferropuncta, and then there's the the valley carpenter bee, which is common throughout the Central Valley. Um, yes, so they are native, and I uh, can't speak for all of the species, but I know that um, Ferropuncta and Californica, those are both desert species, and they um, are they do not nest in the woods of your the wood of your homes. So they actually prefer um, uh, usually it's like stock plants like agave or yucca. They will nest in the in the stocks along the stocks. So that's where these uh, uh, carpenter bees typically nest in the wild and and even in in like urban areas where. Um, a lot of people have like those uh, century plants and stuff. So that's typically where they're nesting or in dead wood or like rotting wood, so like fallen trees. Awesome. Um, we have another question. Uh, some have planted marigolds as companion plants with tomatoes, but are these flowers dangerous to pollinators? Mm -hmm. So um, it's, I, I'm not sure, I know, um, the only, the only uh, genus, or I'm not sure what the level of uh, taxonomy is, but curcurbid plants, or cur, cur, yeah, curcurbid plants are, um, can be harmful to certain pollinators because of the, the, um, it's like the, the amino acid concentration that is in the pollen is, is not good for pollinators. But um, typically, if you look, if you just uh, do a quick Google about a certain type of flower and look up like, um, yeah, like marigold pollinator toxicity or something like that, you can get an answer. Um, and it's it's not that these are, that non-native plants are um, like uh, typically toxic to pollinators. It's just that they're less nutritious than native plants are because they, they're not co-evolved with them. Um, Gaylene Gaylene's has Calscape. Um, that is another great yeah. resource for finding native plants for your area. Um, Wendy, if you, for area you're in, um, and I'll send the links out to both of these in the email afterwards. 
Um, Anne asks, what specific asters since you, men since you mentioned them? Um, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not very good with like species specific stuff, but, um, and, and I work in the White Mountains, so the asters that are there are, are like alpine, um, alpine stuff. Um, but I would imagine that you could find that information pretty easily on like the resource that, that Marie um, said she would hand out. Those are basically just like the sunflower plants. So any type of um, compound flower that has, you know, like the, the, um, the leaves that are a certain color and then has many little flowers in, in the in the middle. Um, our next question. Uh, do hummingbirds act like bees when it comes to being pollinators? Um, so they are so, um, you know, it kind of it, it, it depends on what species of plants we're talking about because uh, hummingbirds have are pretty particular in terms of the plants that they visit um, because they have such a long beak and they have a long tongue they've evolved with uh, flowers that are very deep so if you think of like a trumpet flower like um oh what's that genus i think it's um Nicotiana is is a common one that has like that trumpet flower shape. So they are they only pollinate particular flowers like that. And typically, um, what makes bees so efficient is that they have specialized um, morphology that allows them to really efficiently transfer pollen. Um, so hummingbirds do not have like um, like scopa, which is the pollen carrying hairs on bees. So they are technically less efficient, but um, it, it, it depends. They're, they are they are very efficient at, at pollinating their native partnering plants, I would say. Um, some of the ones that are here in the Owens Valley that are commonly pollinated by hummingbirds are like firecracker penstemon, um, some of the other penstemons, western columbine, mm -hmm. um, and hummingbird trumpet are just a few that in the Owens Valley that are really good for hummingbirds. Um, and this is on our recommended plant list. Um, so you will have a visual of this afterwards. Um, tomatoes and blueberries are buzz pollinated. Uh, do other critters besides bumblebees take care of this? Um, so I believe, uh, so carpenter bees are buzz pollinators, but there's a pretty, per, there's a, a kind of a small list of the bees that do that. Um, but if there are native, so if there are native, uh, yeah, if it, like in Owens Valley, there are um, uh, plenty of bumblebees, so um, you should be okay with that. And in, in terms of your garden for like tomatoes and stuff, it it's a, might be a good idea to hand pollinate them. Um, I know that's what a lot of people do. Um. Yep, Gaylene mentioned that uh, Cal flora or cowscape um, shows what pollinators they benefit. Yeah, and I, so I'll, I'll let me, I'll uh, just talk a little bit about lepidopterans because I oh. have a lab mate who, who studies them in particular and, and would be upset if I didn't. So, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so lepidopterans are actually one of the most diverse families of animals in the entire world. There's something like, um, like 80,000 species of lepidopterans. And almost all of those are not butterflies, they are moths. Um, and uh, so butterflies are really important diurnal or daytime pollinators. Uh, well, they, are, they can be important daytime pollinators. Again, they don't have um, specialized morphology to carry pollen, so they're not fantastic at transferring pollen from one plant to another. But nocturnal pollinators like moths are really important to the pollination of a lot of different plants. Um, and that's especially true in, in deserts and in Owens Valley, I bet, because um, in these hot systems uh, and hot and dry systems, um, a lot of plants have evolved to close their flowers during the day because having an open flower is very water intensive. So certain species have um, evolved to open their flowers only at night, which conserves water and um, therefore, they rely only on nocturnal um, moth pollination. So that's another thing that you could maybe think about when you're um, making your garden is to also include um, nocturnal flowers. 
Um, and one flower that's really good in the Owens Valley for that um, is the white evening primrose. Mm -hmm. um, and that will attract a lot of like the hawk moss um, that are in this area. So there's a lot of the cactus or cacti flowers also will do that. Um, the, yeah, if it's pollinated by hummingbirds, then it's also probably pollinated by moths um, because they have similar morphology. Moths have very long proboscis or tongues, and so do um, so do hummingbirds. The showy milkweed you referenced. Do monarch monarch caterpillars feed on this? Um, yes, as far as I know, I'm not um, super knowledgeable about Western monarchs, but I know, um, at least where I've worked in the past, they have. And I think it depends mostly on the flight patterns of monarchs. Um, and I, I, I just don't know enough about them to, to say whether, um, like, I'm not sure if Owens Valley is a, is a prominent flight path for Western monarchs or if they go to the, to the west of the Sierras. Because um, I know they do that, but I'm not sure if they go to the east. Um, for one of our upcoming workshops, we are hoping to focus a little bit more um, on butterflies and moss. So stay tuned for that one. We'll ho hopefully have more information on That's great. Um, that specific. The wild bee populations that settle on school campuses and homes, are these interbred Africanized with the honeybees that must be and must be stopped? Um, so it depends, uh, like what you mean by wild bee populations. When I think of wild bee populations, I think of like, uh, like bumblebees and all the other kinds of bees. But if you mean wild honeybee populations, um, then, um, yes, they, uh, it's, it's hard to, uh, I don't think anyone has, or at least I haven't read anything about, um, scientists like quantifying the distribution of Africanized hives over just like naturalized hives, but I have been told that in the Southwest, um, it's it's a highly likely that these Af or that these um, wild honeybee hives are um, Africanized. But um, yeah, so they don't really. I don't know if they should be like stopped, but um, yeah, potentially. Um, hand pollinate tomatoes using a tuning fork. Is that what you suggest? Um, I, to be honest with you, haven't done it. I would maybe um, refer to the internet to see what other tomato specialists do. I think if you, they should be okay being naturally pollinated. Um, yeah. I would think. If you yeah, want to I, I think I've used, further, a tooth, or I've used like a paintbrush to do it. I know that's pretty common. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, shout out to coleopterans. Yeah, beetles are, are those beetles? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they are important. And um, yeah, a lot of the, there are, there are many um, other species of insects or other types of insects that do not get the representation they deserve. Like um, ants are really important pollinators. Some termites even pollinate. And uh, yeah, a lot of beetles are also pollinators. Um, and the last question I see in the chat is, Detora, is that how you say it? Or Jimson mm -hmm. native here? Um, we've seen very many bees interested in them. Yeah, I know. Well, Detura is native here in, in Riverside. I'm not. I'm not certain about um, in Owens Valley, um, but it is a native California plant. Any other final questions? All right, well, thank you so much for all being here. Um, it's great to see you and connect with you. Um, and feel free, I'll be sending out some of these resources, but feel free to re reach out if you have any questions. Um, and huge thank you to Elijah to mm -hmm. presenting today.